up guys and welcome back to Monique. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica. Hey, how you doing? And if you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe you were just here to hear about the Odyssey book one. Well then this is not only the video for you, this is also the playlist and the channel for you. You guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so that you know every single time I post in the future. But onto the topic of today's video and as you can see from the title and the fact I just ruined it for you, we're going to be discussing the Odyssey book one. So if I could summarize book one into one sentence, it would be that Athena goes down to start Telemachus to get off his little teeny tiny booty. That is exactly what happens in this book. I always say that sentence really fast. And the idea is just so that you guys know essentially what happens in the chapter if you have to summarize it in class. I don't know, maybe you're reading this for class, maybe you just need it yourself. The chapter titles tend to be really good in the Odyssey, I'm not gonna lie. They're not like the Iliad where I'm like, well, that wasn't the funniest thing. The Odyssey is a little bit better with that sort of stuff, but that is what happens in this book. Athena takes on a disguise in true godly fashion and tells Odysseus' son to stop moping, basically. But why don't we just dive into the narrative because I could sit here and babble all day and nobody wants to see that, so let's go. So the whole poem opens by Homer evoking a muse. Now, if you don't know, this is a very normal thing for ancient poetry, so all the time the poet will be like, muse, daughter of Zeus, please help me tell this story because it's really long and I need help. And that's how this opens, that he tells the muse, we're gonna tell the story of this guy who had all of these hardships this really hard time getting home, this really long journey after he had succeeded in Troy. We know that he has been driven off course time and time again in his journey home, and that he even tried to get all of his comrades home, all of his uh, men home from Troy, but unfortunately they brought about their own downfall because they ended up eating these cattle that were sacred to the sun god, and so the sun god killed them. Basically, he tells us that, so we know that that part is already gonna pop up in the rest of the poem at some point. Anyways though, at this point he also tells us that in mythological history, all of the heroes who were at Troy, who survived, and now home, all except one. Obviously, there is one man, Odysseus, who is hated by Poseidon. And he's like, that is the sole reason as to why he's not home yet. That even though the other gods take pity on him, and they really want him to get home to his family, and to let them know that he's safe and all of this, Poseidon is basically like, you can f yourself. And we do find out that reason in a hot second, but not right now. But fortunately for this story, Poseidon currently, at this point in time, at the present moment, he is in Ethiopia, because the Ethiopians decided that they were gonna honor him with like a feast and be like, oh my god, you're so amazing. So obviously because he's a god, he's like, I am. And so he is now feasting with the Ethiopians. So it's now the time to get Odysseus home because he is currently stuck on an island with this nymph called Calypso and he's held captive there because she wants him as her husband and he's miserable, okay? So the gods have decided that now they're gonna have a little assembly sans Poseidon because he's not there. And Zeus calls them all together, right? He calls them all together on Olympus and he says, look guys, I want you first and foremost to remember the story of Orestes and Aegisthus. And he goes on to explain this mythology that we actually don't have from the epic cycle. We have it later from a playwright called Aeschylus and it's this whole saga about what happened when Agamemnon went home because it's a cr incredibly dramatic, okay? It's one of the best stories ever, but we don't have it from the original epic cycle apart from in this moment, which is great. Zeus actually uses this story to explain. He prefaces this story by saying to all of the gods that humans constantly blame the gods for all of their miseries for all of the problems that they have throughout their life, throughout their journeys, when half the time he says it's their fault. And he used the example of Aegisthus, where he says that Aegisthus was told by Hermes, bear in mind, they sent Hermes down and they said, hey, we see that you have this idea. You wanna go and court Clytemnestra, who is the wife of Agamemnon, who is currently at war at Troy. Don't do that because it's not a good idea and it's going to end badly for you. And what did Aegisthus do? He went, I couldn't give less of a what you're telling me, I think she's really hot and I think this is a great idea. And so he went and he caught Clytemnestra, courted, not like court. I realize when I say that they sound exactly the same. But he went and he courted Clytemnestra, he won her heart over, they end up conspiring together so that when Agamemnon comes home from the Trojan War, they kill him in the tub, but her son, her and Agamemnon's son, not Aegisthus' son, so Clytemnestra and Agamemnon's son is this guy called Orestes and he comes back many years later and he kills Aegisthus to avenge his father. And this is a great story, but Zeus is using this in the moment to express how mortals are greedy, that they say you can have this glory, but that's it. And mortals are like, you know what? I actually want a little bit more than that. And that's exactly what happened to Aegisthus. And that is why he is paying the price for his own wrongdoings. Athena then pipes up in this moment. And she says that even though she agrees that Aegisthus did deserve his fate, her heart weeps 
for Odysseus. She's like, he is so hard done by, like he doesn't deserve this. He's not done anything. He's kept captive on this island. And apparently, oh, it's really sad. Apparently he's so miserable there that he's constantly straining his eyes out into the distance to try and see Ithaca. Just to see like, like a little bit of smoke come up from the islands that he knows where home is. Cause he's, he misses it so much. He's trying to forget it. He's trying to see this little bit of smoke, this little, little smidge of home. And he wishes that he would die there because he's like, if I'm not going home, then fuck this, I don't want to live. And it is so, sad. And even though she's describing this really heartbreaking moment, this really heartbreaking reality for Odysseus, she turns to Zeus and she's like, do you not remember every single time he left you a sacrifice, when he prayed to you, when he honored you? Why are you so hell bent set against him and leaving him captive on this island? Which obviously, because Zeus is hella sassy, he turns around and he's like, how the f do you think I could forget who Odysseus is? That's complete nonsense. Zeus clarifies in this moment that it's not him that has anything to do with Odysseus being stuck on the island. He says, it's Poseidon. Poseidon is a nut job at the moment. I want him home as much as the rest of us. And he explains that Poseidon hates him because he actually, Odysseus he, had actually blinded his most favorite child. So if you didn't know that Poseidon is actually the god, the parent of all of the Cyclopses in mythology. So everybody with one eye is a child of Poseidon. And so at some point we'll read this in the rest of the book and they're telling us the entire story right now. But at some point in the rest of the book, we will see the episode with Polyphemus, who is the Cyclops and Odysseus blinds him. And that is why Poseidon hates him so much and we do also find out that the way that he had the cyclops because you're probably like he's a sea god where did the one eye come from so he ended up hooking up with this woman called thusa right that is <laughs> i don't that's her name and they ended up hooking up in a cave and then she birthed polyphemus and the other cyclopses now i always have a question when i'm reading this because i'm just like was this a booty call in the cave was she hanging out in the cave and then and then poseidon showed up and he was just like let's hook up maybe this was like a cave where they normally hooked up in maybe she lived in this cave and he just like wandered in was was he in disguise? Was he Poseidon? See, with Zeus, we get all of these details. With this Poseidon episode, we don't. So, questions. Probably none of them will be answered. I've accepted that. Anyways, that was a slight digression on my part. Zeus tells us in this moment that Poseidon won't actually kill Odysseus. He's just gonna drive him really far off course. So it's their job now, now that like a bunch of them are meeting on Olympus, all of them are gonna put their heads together because he can't really, Poseidon can't really fight against all of them if they wanna bring Odysseus home. So that's what he says. Athena obviously is thrilled by this news because Odysseus is her favorite. And so she says, look, this is a fantastic thing that we're all gonna put our heads together. And where we should probably start is by sending Hermes, the messenger god, down to Calypso to tell her that Odysseus' exile on the island of Ogygia is up. That is the island that she lives on, by the way. And uh, she's like, we should probably just let her know that she's gotta let Odysseus get home. Like she's the first one to physically let him go. Athena then will take on the role of going down to Telemachus, who is Odysseus' son. And she said that she's gonna tell him to go to Pylos, to Sparta, and that's it actually. She's gonna go and tell him to go there to talk to the old heroes of the Trojan War to find out what happened to his dad. And then she also is going to encourage him to not kill the suitors, but to threaten to kill the suitors. She's like, he's gotta toughen the fuck up, like he's a man now. And she gets so excited by this that she starts putting on her shoes, she picks up her spear, and she races down to Ithaca, because she's just like, peace out guys, here's the plan, just do it. She takes on the guise of this man called Mentes or Mentes. I've actually heard it pronounced in both ways. The Greek person is here, once again, correct me in the comments, this is how it's spelt. So this is the man that she takes the form of. He is the Lord of the Taphians, which is another island in Greece. And so she rolls up in this disguise to the palace gates. And when she gets there, she sees all of these suitors who are just literally lounging about, right? Like on the grass. They're just like chilling on these um, hides of ox because they've killed these oxen, which are not theirs, mind you, because they're suitors, they are guests. That is the point. Uh, so they're like lounging on all of these things. And she's just standing there watching all of these servants like rush about them and like give them wine and give them food and all of this. And she's a bit like, holy crap, what is happening here? Now Telemachus is actually sitting outside amongst all the suitors. He's sort of in the back and he's daydreaming about envisioning his dad come home. And he sees Athena in disguise standing at the palace gate and he freaks out. He like literally gets up, he runs over to her and he's just like, I'm so sorry, like grabs her hand, grabs her spear out of her hand to like take it away. And he's like, I'm so sorry you've been standing here. It's incredibly rude. Why don't you come into the palace with me? We'll get you cleaned up. We'll get you some food and then we can share stories. Now, 
This is a really important thing in ancient history, which you guys might not know, in mythology especially, this idea of hospitality, super important. So for him to be doing this and for him to be acting this way is exactly how he should be acting this way. And the suitors, as you'll come to see, are totally taking advantage of the situation and of the custom, and that is the point. So when he comes and he takes Athena in, he then, you know, walks her into the, the high ceilinged grand hall and all of this sort of shebang. And they end up sitting down, he puts her speech up against a like a sturdy pillar right I think that's literally what the Greek is puts it up against a sturdy pillar and he pulls out a chair like a really nice tall chair for her to sit on that has like a cloth and everything uh, tells her to sit there and for himself he pulls out a low reclining chair again this is important because of the levels that they're sitting at he places his guest at a higher chair than his own, even though he's the prince of this palace. He's getting 10 out of 10. We've only seen two things from him and he gets 10 out of 10 on the hospitality scale. Wonderful. We then have some maids come over and first and foremost, one of them brings over this jug of water with this like silver basin underneath it. And the two of them rinse their hands. This is normal custom again. So they rinse their hands, they wash their hands, and then all of this food is brought over. An extra table even is brought over for the meats to be carved on. So you've got bread and all these meats and appetizers. And as they're doing this and they're eating themselves, then all of the suitors come in. They all decide to take their own chairs and eat Literally, they're described as eating whatever their hands can reach. So if it's on the table in front of them, they're taking it, which like rude. And when they're done with all this eating, they end up taking a liar and giving it to this guy called Femius. As you don't really need to know his name. They give it to a guy who's a bard basically. And he stands up and he starts singing with his little liar because they force him to. They're like, you need to entertain us now because we've eaten. And so Femius is just like, oh, okay. And he gets up with his little liar and he's like, la 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 la. And that's important because that's exactly what Homer would have been doing in this moment when he was telling this story to somebody else. So everybody who was hearing this would have known exactly what that felt like. We don't, but they would have. Minus the rudeness of the suitors, but anyways. As this guy is singing, Telemachus gets really, really close to Athena in disguise. And he says to her, look at how none of these suitors have a care in the goddamn world because all they're doing is feeding off of somebody else, him and his family, all of their wealth. And they are just sitting here and they seem to be enjoying themselves because they believe, he says they truly believe that the king of this palace, the king of this island is dead and his body is either rotting in the ocean or it's rotting somewhere on land. And he says, imagine if that man were to walk back and how polite they would start acting and how they would drop to their knees and they would like pray and they would try to honor him correctly. But look at how disgusting they're being right now. Like he points that out to Athena. So we know that he knows they're acting incorrectly and they are totally abusing the hospitality that he's given them. But he also has a moment of just being like, you know what, enough of the sorry me sort of mentality. You're a guest here, you're a stranger. So why don't you tell me who you are? Ooh, the plant. Anyways, he says, why don't you tell me? I I'm so sorry for that little intrusion, but anyway, he says, why don't you tell me uh, who you are and why you're here? And maybe we can then, you know, have a little nice conversation. You can tell me something if you know anything about Odysseus. She introduces herself as Mentes or Mentes, and she says that she's the Lord of the Taphians, and actually she did know Odysseus. So she's, well, I say she, but she is obviously in the form of a man. But I just realized that in my other videos, when I say that a god is in disguise, and then I use their name, people started getting confused. So that's why I'm saying she, because it's Athena in disguise. And she tells him, like, oh, actually, we are like super old old friends, me and Odysseus, even though she hasn't seen him since before he went off to Troy. In fact, she also knew Laertes really well and she's actually heard that he doesn't venture down into the city anymore, he doesn't venture into the palace, he lives on his own, and Odysseus occupies the palace with his family by himself. Now she also said that she was told Odysseus had made it home, which is actually why she stopped through, because she thought she'd be able to say hi to Odysseus, but clearly the gods have driven her and him off course because he's not home and it's very sad. But she tells him that Odysseus is not dead. She's like, look, the gods told me this prophecy. Remember it's Athena, but either way, she's playing a part. So she says, the gods have told me this prophecy, but I'm not actually sure if it was a dream or not. I'm not entirely sure if it's true, but take it with a grain of salt either way. They told me he's still alive and he's coming home soon, which is super exciting for literally everybody involved in this story, including us. We're like, yes, Odysseus is coming home. And so in this moment, she says, why don't you tell me about you? You look like Odysseus's son. Are you Odysseus's son? Because you are the spitting image of him. Apparently we hear this multiple times throughout the opening books that Telemachus looks just like his dad. So she's like, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? And Telemachus is like, that's okay. But I just got to start this by saying, my mom always told me that Odysseus was my dad, but I've got no idea because I never properly met him to a point where I can remember what he looked like or who he is. So I'm not entirely sure who my dad is, but I have to trust my mom, which is definitely, he's having a little bit of a moment here. And when you're reading it, you're like, oh, 
She's definitely a little stressed by this. But Athena says not to worry. She's just like, look, one, you look just like him. And two, Penelope is a good woman. And clearly this house, even though you think you're very unlucky, you're not all that unlucky. Minus, and she does say, I'm a little bit confused as to who the f all these randos are though. Like, what's the deal? Is this a wedding party? What's happening here and who are they and how long are they staying for? Like literally comments on how bad their behaviors are so that we know as the reader, they are not acting correctly in regards to hospitality and they are definitely pushing their luck. Telemachus then replies and he says that actually once upon a time their palace was super rich and they had a great king, they had Odysseus and they had lots of stuff to offer. They had lots of things to give people, but the suitors are here and they are bleeding them dry because Odysseus hasn't come home and everybody believes that he's dead. So they believe that Penelope, his mother, not Odysseus' mother, obviously Telemachus' mother, but they believe that Penelope has to be married again. So they want to be king of Ithaca. So all of the lords of Ithaca and the kings of the surrounding islands have shown up to try and marry her. And the most interesting thing about this scene, in my opinion, is when Telemachus tells us that Penelope is not actually rejecting any of them. That he says she doesn't come down here and outwardly reject any of the marriages that she doesn't want. She's disgusted by the idea of these marriages because she loves Odysseus. And she's not telling them to go home. She's not rejecting them. She's not telling them to go home. So of course they have stuck around for this long because she's a bit like, mm, I guess you can stay if you want to. Which I have to say, I think all of us can kind of identify with Penelope in this moment when someone likes you and it's a little bit of an ego boost So you're not gonna 100% tell them to go but you're not gonna give them any green lights either She's very much like stay at a distance But at the same time you can definitely tell me that I'm really hot because I haven't heard that in 20 years It's been a long time for Penelope now obviously in response to this Athena is like what the actual f is going on in this house. This is a mad house at this point. And so she then, you know, once again, brings attention to the suitors, how badly they're acting. And she says that she wishes the Odysseus that she last saw could come and meet these suitors because he would kill them all. She's like, he would not put up with any of this bullshit. And that's because the last time she saw him, he had actually stopped off at her house on like a different island on Taphos, right? He'd stopped off over there and he was looking for um, poison for the edges of his spear. That's a very specific thing he was looking for. But either way, a, there was another guy who was there who said no because he was terrified of the gods because if he offered this poison, he was like, are the gods gonna punish me? And then Odysseus ends up getting the poison anyways because he's a bad man. That's the point of the story is that he's a bad man. He does what he has to do. He doesn't really care. He's like, this is a king, okay? He knows what he has to do in order to win in order to stay on top. So Athena says, if only that Odysseus could meet these people, they would be gone in a second. She then gives Telemachus his own instructions and she says, up until the morning, start thinking about how you can get rid of these suitors and how you can get them to go home. But in the morning, you should call an assembly, tell all of the lords of the islands and all of the suitors to come to this assembly so that you can all talk and tell them to go home because they're being rude. She's like, tell them to leave. This is your palace. You can do whatever you want, quite frankly. After he's done this, if Penelope still wants to get married, she tells Telemachus to send Penelope home to her father, Icarius, and he will marry her off to somebody else. She's like, that is not your job. Your job is to deal with the suitors. And then if she wants to get married, fine. Let Icarius find some guy. Not any of these dummies. His job instead is to go and get a ship and to spill it up with like 20 oarsmen, right? She's like, get all these people who want to row and then get on the boat. And then you should be going to Pelos because at Pelos, there's a really old man called Nestor who you should probably talk to about your dad. And then you should go on to Sparta. I forgot where Sparta was for a second. You should go on to Sparta and you should talk to Menelaus. She does tell us right now, by the way, that Menelaus is ginger, right? He's red-haired Menelaus. In case you wanted to like get some help in envisioning him. <laughs> He's a ginger man. But either way, she's like, go and talk to him because he also, apparently she tells us now that he took a really long time to get home. He was the penultimate guy to get home. It took Menelaus seven whole years to get back to Sparta. So she's like, he would probably know what happened or at least has heard more than most people because he traveled further. So maybe he knows something else about Odysseus. Now, Athena informs him that after this, if he hears of Odysseus being alive, then he has to wait. Then Telemachus just has to wait until Odysseus comes home. But if he hears that Odysseus is dead and he's died wherever, however long ago, then he's supposed to come back to Ithaca perform the correct burial rites for his father and that's that. Once those have been performed, he can then actually kill the suitors if he wants to. She's like, you're totally allowed to do that. Again, we hear the story of Orestes and she says, you know how Orestes did this really great thing for Agamemnon and he killed Aegisthus to avenge his father. You're gonna do that with the suitors and someday people will sing great songs for you in the same way that they are singing great praises about Orestes. And with that, she literally gets up to walk away. She's just like, all right, I've said what I've had to say and I'm gonna go back to my shipmates and they're all waiting for me, so like, bye. And as she's walking away, to 
Bumka stands up and he's just like, wait, hold on, who are you? What's happening? I'm very confused and I don't really know what to do. And Athena basically just tells him like, I told you everything that I have to, you are gonna be totally fine. And she just turns around, she flies away like a bird. And as she does this, she inspires him with all of this courage and uh, nerve is the word that's used. So he gets this like little boost, basically, this little boost of energy. And he knows in that moment that he was not talking to a rando, he was talking to a goddess. He's like, Athena just told me exactly what to do. Now I have to do it. Telemachus then walks over to take his seat closer to the other suitors. And he listens to this song that the bard is still singing. Bear in mind, the bard is still singing. This was a very hushed conversation in between the two of them. So the bard is still singing and he's singing of, this is very interesting, he's singing of the journey that the Greeks had to take home from Troy. So he sings this whole epic that we don't have access to. But what's interesting to think about is the people who are hearing the story from a bard in ancient times, this story, the story of the Odyssey, would have known the story that Phemius is telling, but we don't, which is slightly irritating. But he sings of how Athena herself, and this is part of mythology that we know, uh, that she made the whole journey for all of them very difficult. Now we do get an explanation of this a little bit later in this book, but once again, just remember that there was so much mythology surrounding this book that this probably would have happened in real time somewhere else. But we get it in this book in, in a, like what, two books time or something? Or maybe next book, I can't really remember. But either way, we do get a little insight into what exactly happened here. But either way, Femius is singing this whole thing and we've got Penelope who's upstairs in her room, right? We cut to Penelope and she can kind of hear what Femius is singing about and she's like, mm. Don't really like that. So she gets her two handmaidens to stand on either side of her and they like walk downstairs. It reminds me of, have you seen a Cinderella story when you have Shelby Cummings and she's got her two little like angels next to her. Like like the who are dressed up as angels, obviously not actually angels. And they're standing there just being like, oh my God, I'm so hot. That's what this reminds me of. I don't know why, but it does. So Penelope goes down into the hall and she sort of stands there for a moment, like next to this massive pillar and no one even bats an eye at her. And she's standing there staring at this room being like, hello, give me some attention. No one gives a so finally Penelope goes, yo, Phemius, remember how my husband still hasn't come home from the Trojan War? Remember how he's still somewhere in the world trying to get back to me and he hasn't? That makes this song very inappropriate, so cut it the f out. Which is actually well funny that the first time we actually meet Penelope, she does have a little bit of a boss moment where she yells at a room full of men. This is not like five of them, this is a lot of them. And she yells at this one guy, which I love. Now it doesn't actually go in her favor, unfortunately, right? So Telemachus then stands up and he turns around to his mother and he's just like, it's not this guy's fault that Odysseus is not home. Why are you telling him to stop singing this song of other people? when it's not his fault. He's just like, don't get mad at this bard for Zeus's wrongdoing. He's like, Zeus is the one who's decided who's getting home at what time, has nothing to do with Femius. Poor Femius, don't yell at him in front of other people and embarrass him. He actually says something really interesting to Penelope in this moment, where he tells her that she's not the only woman who's lost a husband in Troy. And in fact, most people's husbands didn't even make it out of Troy alive. So her husband could be dead or alive at this point, right? He's just wandering the earth as far as they're aware. They have no idea if he's alive or dead. But he says, you're not the only person. So why are you acting like you're the only one who's lost a husband and you could possibly be in pain from it? He's like, no, cut it out. Stop with this, I feel so bad for myself moment. Because of that, he tells her to go back upstairs and to keep weaving with all her women. He's just like, get out of here. You're not meant to be here. And he says, I have this obviously written down. He says in line 414, I hold the reins of power in this house, which I know to a lot of people sounds well rude. And when you read it, you are a bit like, dude, Simma, what the f that's your mum. But at the same time, this was a really big moment for him because he had to man up, right? Athena basically told him the entire time, man the f up and do all these things. And he's now standing up and taking his role in a patriarchal society, bear in mind, patriarchal society, he's gotta be man of the house. And he steps up right now in book one. But Penelope is astonished, right? She is shocked that Telemachus has spoken to her in this way. And she literally just stares at him and is like, say that to me again, what? But she doesn't reply to him because she knows her space in the specific society that she's in. So instead she goes upstairs and does as she's told. When she gets upstairs, she cries. Apparently she cries for the rest of the evening, the rest of the day uh, until Athena has decided that she's cried enough. And so she's just like, you can go to sleep now. So that's the last time that we see Penelope in this book. And we cut back to the room with all the suitors and all of them really grossly. Uh, as Penelope is walking away, they're all just sort of like heckling at her, sort of like praying that they would go up to bed with her and share the sheets with her. And you're like, ew, disgusting. Nobody asked for your opinion. And thankfully Telemachus also thinks that they're really gross, right? He stands up and he's like, all of you are plaguing this house and plaguing my mother. And he tells them that in the morning, they're all gonna meet in an assembly. He says, now you guys can all sit and enjoy the festivities, enjoy the food and all of this 
Tomorrow we're going to meet in an assembly, so start thinking now about what I'm about to tell you, because in the assembly, we're going to address the fact that you all should go home and stop being here, because I'm really over all of you literally sucking the life out of this house and this family. And he says, if you guys don't want to actually go home, and you don't want to stop living here and stop taking all of my resources, then I'm going to pray to Zeus, and then Zeus will figure out a way to punish you, and I might think about killing every single one of you, so you can stay but at your own risk. Which every time I read this, I think is a little bit of a cop out. It's like, dude, just take, just stand up into your role. Just take it, take it like a man and tell him to f off. But this is enough, right? We have to bear in mind that it's baby steps to getting to the man of the house, okay? And when he speaks and when he says all of this, the suitors are apparently in shock. Like all of them are like, whoa, where did this Telemachus come from? And in fact, one of them even stands up and yells back at him and is just like, excuse me, who do you think you are yelling at us and being so high and mighty? And you might think when you read this, oh, he said high and mighty. That's kind of a nice thing to say. And he doesn't mean it in that way. He means it in the way that I just presented it, which is like, um, excuse you, get the rod out of your ass. And he ends this by being childish and saying, I hope that you're never king, even though your dad is king. And it's highly likely that you will inherit being the king, but I hope that you won't. Like, it's just ridiculous. And I'm like, again, on the trash talk -o meter if you guys watch my Iliad series, um, there is a trash talk -o meter This is like a one. Homer's really not good at writing this. But either way, Telemachus does reply to this in an equally as like stupid way, but he's very cool-headed about it. Telemachus basically says in response to this that he's going to be king because his dad is king and therefore he's going to inherit it. And it's going to be great to be king because why wouldn't you want to be king? You have all this wealth in the house and you can support your family and all of this and you can take charge. He will be a good king apparently. Uh, and so then another guy, not the first guy, a different suitor then stands up and heckles him again. He says that it's not actually in their hands. It's in none of their hands if any of them become king. It's in the gods' hands. The gods will decide who will be the next king of Ithaca. Uh, and so Telemachus can't be so cocky because he's like, what if one of us marries Penelope and therefore one of us becomes the king? Because that's why they're there. They all want to be king of Ithaca. So he's like, you never know. And then he changed the top of conversation and he's like, who the f*** was the other guy, by the way, that you were just talking to? The guest that came in for 0 0.5 seconds because when he came in, he sat down, he didn't even say hi to any of us. And that was kind of rude, which is so rich coming from the suitors that they're like this random stranger who gave you the time of day and didn't totally take everything from this palace and eat all of your food and take up all of your space. Uh, yeah, he was rude. What? You're rude. Stop talking. Telemachus then tells them who the guest was, but he doesn't tell them that he knows it's Athena. But Homer lets us know that he's even thinking in his mind at this moment that it definitely was Athena. He knows it was Athena, but the suitors don't need to know that. And so that's why he doesn't tell the suitors this little detail right now. But either way, all of them end up singing and dancing in this moment. They eat everything on the table, like literally they eat everything on the table. And then they all go to bed. They all go to their respective beds. And Telemachus goes to his room, which is off in the courtyard, which is like miles away from, not miles, literally, but it's a while away from everything else. And when he's there, his maid, so he's this maid called Eurycleia. And as you guys know, I don't mention names for anybody who's not important. Eurycleia will be important at the end of the book. So she's mentioned now, and then she's not mentioned, and then she'll be mentioned right at the end. She plays a very important role. So remember that name, it's spelt like this. Now, Eurycleia, we find out that she was actually bought by Odysseus's father, Laertes, when he was king. And he traded, he paid, 20 oxen for her, which is the same price that he had paid for his wife because there was a dowry in this time. So we know that she was super important to him, but we also know that he never slept with her. Homer tells us that now. He says that, actually, he says it's because that Laertes was so scared of his own wife that he didn't cheat on her, especially not with like a servant. So they just had a really good working relationship together. And then she looked after Odysseus and now she's looking after Telemachus. So when Telemachus goes into his room, Eurycleia is there, he like takes off his shirt and he, I was gonna say throws it, but he more so like lightly tosses it to Eurycleia. She catches it, hangs it up on a hook and she leaves. And then Telemachus gets into bed and he starts thinking about all of the things that Athena has told him to do the next day. And that is the end of book one. There's a lot. The Telemachy is very heavy. This whole book is very heavy and there aren't like chunks of it that I can leave out because you'll need to know all these things for later. So I'm sorry that these videos will be a little bit longer, but uh, thank you guys for tuning in. I hope that you guys enjoyed book one. I hope you guys are reading along with me. If there's any points that you are confused about, or maybe you're reading the ancient text, or you've just got questions for after watching this review, you can definitely leave them in the comments. I tried to reply to everybody. There are some comments that I don't know how to reply to because there's no question involved. But if you guys have a genuine question, leave it down there. If I don't get to it, there's always another member of Moan's community that does get to it, which is something I really love about this little community that we're building here on YouTube. So thank you guys so much for watching and we'll be seeing you next 
next time with book two of Homer's Odyssey. We'll see you guys then.